the best laid plans of mice and men. Do you know where that phrase comes from? It comes from a poem written by Robert Burns in 1785 entitled The Mouse. It's an account of a farmer who's pondering the existence of a mouse. The mouse, the mouse had sensed winter approaching and as a matter of preparation and prudence, what any smart mouse would do, the mouse began to construct a little grass house in a field. However, the farmer realizes that he has just plowed through that mouse's house unawares, and now the small creature is scampering through the fields amidst the sleet and ice of winter, looking for a place to stay. All the plans of that mouse, the preparation, the hard work of that mouse, just destroyed. Blindsided by a disastrous surprise, the best laid plans. But it's not just the mouse that's caught up in this, as that famous line would indicate. The best laid, plan, the, excuse me, the best laid schemes of mice and men gang off to glay and leave us naught but grief and pain for promised joy. The best laid plans of mice and men gang off to glay and leave us nothing but grief and pain for promised joy. All the plans, all the work, but the, the house is destroyed. I bet there have been days in your life when you could sympathize with the mouse, when you only felt grief and pain for promised joy. It's like that college student who is one semester away from graduating. He's worked through the major he's chosen. He's done it the right way. He's about to get out into the real world. Only one or two classes left. Only one day he receives a call from his sister who says, y you need to come home now. Dad's sick and, and you need to be here. Best laid plans of mice and men. Or that young woman who married the man of her dreams. She had her life all planned out. Career, marriage, children, in that order, all promised joy. Until one day her husband came home and out of the blue said, I, I want a divorce. And just like that, it, it was over. She, she did not see this coming. The best laid plans of mice and men. Or that young family who had their financial future all planned out. They bought a small home in which to build some equity, made some wise investments along the way, had their dream house and dream life in view. Until one day, at a normal checkup, the doctor looked at the wife and said to her, I'm concerned about a spot on your pancreas. And the medical bills began to pile up, just killed them. The best laid plans of mice and men. Sometimes life has a way of making a mockery out of our prudence and our plans. Not our worst plans, our best plans. Sometimes our best laid plans are whisked away like smoke in the wind. I think all of us, to one extent or another, know what it feels like to watch your plans crumble around you and leave you nothing but grief and pain for promised joy. The best laid plans of mice and men. And then we open up the Bible, and it says this, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you, to give you a future and a hope. That's what today's text says. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, to give you a future and a hope. Boy, this verse has become central to much of our popular religion today, hasn't it? Hobby Lobby has made a killing off this verse. I have seen this verse on home decorations and t-shirts, jewelry and art. Honestly, I've encountered more people who claimed this verse as their favorite verse or their life verse than any other verse in our day. This verse has become something of a mantra of our culture. For I know the plans I have for you. I know why this verse carries such great appeal for people. 
One of our greatest fears is lack of direction for our lives. Not so much that we will venture off the path, but that the path we've chosen isn't so much a path as it is just an endless maze that gets us nowhere. I think we fear that we're floating on the mercy of the winds wherever they take us, that our life has no real direction. I think one of our most profound fears is that our lives are caught up in some chaotic frenzy where we're running endlessly on a treadmill but going nowhere. It reminds me of the pilot who came over the intercom and said to the passengers on the plane, I've got bad news and good news. The bad news is that our GPS and radar systems are down and we have no idea where we are or where we're going. The good news is that we're ahead of schedule. <laughs> don't we worry that there are no plans? Don't we worry that we don't really know where we are and even more so we don't know where we're going? And even if we're ahead of schedule, it doesn't do us much good. And yet here God says, I know the plans I have for you. But to the first hearers of this verse, it would have sounded much, much different than the way we've heard it in our day. Chapter 29 in the book of Jeremiah contains a letter from that prophet to the exiles in Babylon. You see, Jeremiah's warning had come true to the people in Jerusalem. The Babylonians did indeed march on the city of Jerusalem. They flattened the walls as if they were nothing. They plundered and looted the temple and then set it on fire until it was nothing more than a heap of rubble and smoke. And then they marched the people off into exile. Some of the ancient archaeology that uh, tells this story has the Israelite people with chains around their necks marching off naked into exile. You can imagine the humiliation and the disorientation this would cause for those people. You can imagine how traumatic this was and how they struggled to make sense of it. If, if Yahweh couldn't even protect His own city, if the Babylonians who worshipped Marduk had marched on Jerusalem and proved victorious, what does this say about the Lord? I thought He was the God above all gods. If the Lord didn't even protect His own house, if the Lord had abandoned the temple, has the Lord abandoned us? And if in the Exodus, Israel's central story, God had liberated them from slavery, what does this mean now that they're going back into slavery? Is their story being reversed is their identity being undone? Is their future crumbling? Jeremiah 29 was not written to people in luxury who wanted to know God's will on some particular in their lives. Whom to date and which car to buy and that sort of stuff. That's not it. Jeremiah 29 was written to people in desperation who must have believed they had no future at all in Babylon. It was written to people who had experienced the very worst of times, who were wondering if God was with them or not, because all the evidence would suggest not. These verses weren't put on decorations. They were spoken as a glimmer of light to people who were living in the depths of a profound darkness, who thought they had no tomorrow. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to give you hope and a future. This word from Jeremiah had to come as a surprise to the people. First of all, when Jeremiah said that God had plans to give them a hope, he did not mean optimism. He did not mean feel-good religion. He did not mean smiles and rainbows and roses. In fact, one of the reasons Jeremiah wrote this letter is because some of the other prophets who were with the people in Babylon were saying, just hang on for a little while. It's not going to be long. God hasn't forsaken you. It won't be long. In the blink of an eye, you'll be out of here. One of the reasons Jeremiah wrote this letter was to counter those false prophets and say, not so fast. In fact, if you listen to the letter, Jeremiah says, Go ahead and make yourselves at home in Babylon. 
You'll be there 70 years, two generations, that sort of stuff. Even having said that though, Jeremiah says that God intends to give the people hope. To be sure, Jeremiah's idea of hope is not looking at the bright side or making lemonade out of lemons or seeing the glass is half full rather than half empty. That's not it at all. There are some people out there who think that hope is the same thing as optimism, even at the expense of telling ourselves the truth. But brothers and sisters, that is not the hope that God gives us. God's hope does not close our eyes to the realities around us. God's hope opens our eyes to the realities around us and calls us to believe and work anyway. The hope that God gives doesn't sidestep the truth of any context or situation. It looks that situation square in the eyes and believes in the face of it. Of all the prophets, Jeremiah's message was the most stern and difficult of them all. In fact, across the centuries, Jeremiah has been called a prophet of doom or the weeping prophet. But in the end, when all the other prophets had shut their mouths, or when all the other prophets closed their eyes to the severity of what had happened, Jeremiah's voice was the one remaining voice saying, God will give you hope. Brothers and sisters, optimism is looking at the best of things. Hope is looking to God, who can make good even out of the worst of things. Optimism says to us, dry your tears and smile. Hope says to us, believe in the face of your tears. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to give you hope and a future. There is one other shocking element to Jeremiah's letter to the exiles. Did you hear it? Did you hear what Jeremiah says to the exiles in Babylon? He says, seek the welfare or the peace. The word in Hebrew is shalom. Seek the shalom of the city. For in its peace you will have peace. Did you hear that? Seek the peace of Babylon? How do you think that sounded to the exiles? Can you imagine how deeply that struck them for Jeremiah to say such a thing, to seek the peace of Babylon? These are the people who had captured them, humiliated them, destroyed their lives, destroyed their homeland, destroyed their city, and Jeremiah has the audacity to say, seek the peace of the city? Can you imagine? Jeremiah says, build homes. Live in them, even in Babylon. Plant gardens and eat your tomatoes. Go ahead and marry your children off in Babylon. Make your home in Babylon. Seek the shalom of Babylon, for in its peace you will find your peace. I, I could be wrong about this, but I can almost hear precursors of Jesus several centuries later saying, Bless your enemies. Bless those who persecute you. Do not live in hate, which is a way of committing murder already. It, it perpetuates cycles of violence. Love your enemies. Bless those who persecute you so that you end cycles of violence. Perhaps Jesus had read Jeremiah's letter to the exiles. I hear a lot of Christians today saying that the God of the Old Testament is different than the God of the New Testament. The God of the Old Testament is a God of blood and vengeance and violence and New Testament. Uh, that's a rather warped view of reading the Bible. Here we have a very Old Testament letter in which the prophet says, Bless those who persecute you. Seek the peace of the city. I guess Jeremiah could see that since we're all connected... There is no peace for any of us until there is peace for all of us. Earlier in this very book, Jeremiah had confronted the false prophets who, if you remember, were saying what? Peace, peace, shalom, shalom, everything's going to be okay. Peace, peace. And Jeremiah says, your peace is a false peace. But here, God intends to give them peace, but only if they seek the peace of Babylon. 
You see, there is a false peace and a true peace. There is a peace which says we can have peace in our enclave as long as our walls are thick enough and tall enough and our doors are triple locked, then we can have peace. But there's a different kind of peace that says we only really have peace when we don't have need of thick and tall walls and where we remove the need to triple lock our doors. There is the sort of peace that comes from subduing your enemy by force and killing them. And then there is the peace that comes from loving your enemy until they're no longer an enemy. In an effort to keep my children safe, I will not ever have peace if that means killing your children. I, I cannot enjoy peace in my little private place in the world while you're suffering under bloodshed and violence in another part of the world. In an effort to keep my, town of sa uh, my part of town safe, I can't just care about my part of town. And in an effort to ensure that my schools are schools of excellence, I can't just care about my schools. As long as our lives are interconnected, so will our peace be. When we learn that our peace is connected with one another, and I can't have peace until you have peace, and you can't have peace until I have peace, only then will we begin to explore the true peace which God gives us. Jeremiah says to the people, Seek the shalom of the city, for in its peace you will have peace. You see, God did not just have plans for them. God had plans for the world. God had plans for Babylon as well. God's micro plans for the exiles were caught up in God's macro plans for all creation. If you think about it, exile was the means through which God told the central story of our scriptures. Think about it. If the Jewish people had not been sent into exile, they never would have spread out. They would have stayed in Jerusalem with their temple, which had become a, a cult and a shrine in and of itself. And then they never would have spread out. Scholars call it the diaspora, the spreading out. It was the exile that caused the spreading out of Jerusalem. It was only because of the exile that you had Jewish people living in cities like Ephesus and Corinth, Greek cities, Athens, Philippi. It was only because of the exile that you had Jewish people living in places like Nazareth. It was only because of the exile. And this is where I think we begin when all of us are trying to discern God's plans for us as individuals. We live into God's plans for us only to the extent that we contribute to God's plans for the whole world. A few years ago, one of my seminary professors, Roger Olson, wrote a book entitled, Questions for All Your Answers. It's, it's an effort at challenging some of the trite, half-true, but not really true cliches that many Christians in our day like to spout, but don't really believe if they think about it at any level of depth. One of the chapters which he explores in this book is entitled, God Has a Perfect Plan for Your Life, colon, so what if you miss it? In this chapter, he argues for a radical rethinking of how we go about understanding God's plans for our lives. Dr. Olson says most people think of God's plans for our lives like a blueprint. But this creates a lot of problems. In fact, it creates more problems than it solves. First of all, it treats God like a computer. God's like map quest, saying, turn left, turn right, stop here. And there's no freedom for the driver. But this isn't how relationships work. It's not how any of our relationships work, is it? In fact, it's not even how our relationship with God works. Secondly, if God has a detailed bl blueprint for your life, what happens when you step away from it? Are you forever outside of that glorious blueprint? Or has God built some sort of dynamism into the plan that interacts with your life and the decisions you make? Lastly, 
If God has a predetermined plan for our lives, what role do we play in that? Do we have an active role in that plan at all? This view of God's plans actually creates more anxiety than comfort. It reminds me of the conferences I used to go to when I was in youth group and college group. We would go and the speaker would say, are you, in the, are you in God's will for your life? Are you living in God's will for you? Are you living in the center of God's will for your life? Are you living in the absolute center of God's will? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are living in the absolute center of God's will for your life. On and on. And I'm thinking, I don't even know what we're having for supper, I'd much less if I'm in the absolute center without a shadow of a doubt. Dr. Olson proposes that we should not think of God's plans for us in that way. But that we should think of God's plans for us more like canvas and paints that God gives us a canvas and a set of paints, meaning gifts and talents, mentors and models, opportunities and graces. And God says, paint something beautiful with your life. And God gives us freedom and choices to paint as He calls us. As believers, we have the Holy Spirit as our guide and Jesus as our model. And much of the painting is in our hands because God gives us space as free creatures. And in the end, after a lifetime of color and lines and shades, hopefully our lives have produced something beautiful. And when your masterpiece is seen alongside your masterpiece and your masterpiece and my masterpiece, then we begin to see something of God's masterpiece in the world. Might I point out to you that in Jeremiah 29, when God says, I have a plan for you, if it was cotton patch gospel, it would be y'all. The you is plural. I have plans for you, together. Brothers and sisters, I, I believe God has plans for all of us and each of us. I believe God has plans to draw us into a secure hope and an, an unbelievable future. I would share the, the words of Adoniram Judson, the great Baptist missionary, who said, the future is as bright as the promises of God. But here's the irony. We don't discover God's plans for our lives by only looking at our lives. God's plans for little old us are caught up in God's plans for all creation, which is why our peace is caught up in everyone else's peace. If you want to discover God's plans for you, take a hard look at the needs of your neighbor. That might be God's plans for you today. If you want to live into your bright future, set your heart to working towards a bright future for everyone around you. That might just be God's plans for your future. If you want to experience God's peace, be a peacemaker. Seek the peace of the city. And if you want to know the will of God, the first step is do the will of God. If you want God to guide you into what you don't know, then be sure that you're following Him into what you do know. In the end, I don't believe that the ultimate thing is for us to know the plans. The goal is to trust the planner. Did you notice how Jeremiah closes this letter? When you cry to me, when you pray to me, I will listen. When you seek me, you will find me, and I will bring you back to the land. Did you hear that? God will go with them. God will walk with them while their broken dreams crumble under their feet. All the would'ves and could'ves that were buried under the rubble in Jerusalem their best laid plans of mice and men, God will lead them through their tears. And God's plea for them is not to discover the plans before they take the first step. God's plea for them 
is to trust the planner enough to take the first step, after which there will be light enough for another step. When you live with simple trust in the planner, the plans come in due time. After all, God says in this letter, I know the plans I have for you. It doesn't say you know the plans I have for you. God says, I know the plans I have for you. The plans are revealed only as we follow them. And if we follow them, we will discover that there is light enough for one more step. There is always light enough for one more step. And that step leads us out beyond our best laid plans. Those steps lead us out into a future that is as bright and glorious as the promises of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? As we pray today, I'd like not so much to pray in words, but to pray with an image. Would you imagine with me that you're on journey with God even now? And as you look up ahead on the way, there is lots of fog, and you do not know where your path will lead, and I do not know where my path will lead, and we do not know where our paths will lead. Could I invite you in this moment, however, to turn around? To turn around and see? Look back across your years. See what all God has brought you through. All the toils and snares. Turn around and see. Now, take the Lord by the hand and turn around one more time. And let's step forward together. O oh Lord, You are the one and the only one who leads us into the future. And this morning we profess our trust in You even though we can't see the plans and where those plans will take us. Give us light enough to keep walking. Give us strength enough to keep journeying. Give us hope enough to keep going. For we know the one who holds the future, and we know the one who holds our hand. Go with us, O oh God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.